Hello everyone, welcome to Scalers YouTube channel. My name is Aditya. I'm currently working as a data architect at PepsiCo. In model 2, we are going to discuss about the evolution of Hadoop, how Hadoop came into the market, and what are the different big data technologies which we use currently. We'll also talk about the difference between OLAP and OLTP system, and difference between ELT and ETL system. I'll also then talk about the difference between on-premise and cloud. Hope you enjoy watching this session. Hi everyone, my name is Aditya. Welcome to Model 2 of Data Engineering. Today we are going to talk about the evolution of Hadoop and we'll start with some of the basic topics and then we'll deep dive into some of the advanced concepts. We'll start with evolution of Hadoop, how Hadoop came into the market. Then we'll talk about what is Hadoop, different components in Hadoop framework, different difference between Hadoop 1.0 and 2.0. We'll talk about master-slave architecture, explanation of heartbeat mechanism. Then we'll talk about explaining the different components in Hadoop 2.0. I'll then explain the uh, difference between ELT and ETL and which one to use, when to use, and which ones uh, the company prefer. We'll talk about some terminology such as OLTP, OLAP, and data maps. These are uh, many times used in the project, so it's better you know, to talk about them. We'll talk about the difference between on-premise and cloud. And point number 10 also talks about what is cloud, so we'll cover point 10 over here. We'll then dif uh, discuss about the difference between batch and streaming data. And there are some terminologies which everyone should know, which is SAAS, SaaS, then PaaS, PAAS, and IAAS, which is IaaS, right? So these topics we'll discuss one by one. Hope you like the session. If any topics is left over, we'll continue with uh, those topics in the next session. So let me take point number one and let me discuss evolution of Hadoop. So for this, uh, let me open my paint and I'll explain you how Hadoop came to the market. Okay, let me take a straight line. So 2003, I think it's not visible, right? Let me expand it. 2003, uh, then we have 2004. 2006. So 2003 is basically the time when uh, Google came up with a concept called GFS. What is GFS? People ask me a lot of time. GFS talks about Google file system. So Google was the first company to, research, to publish a paper, a research paper on Google file system. It talks about if one machine is not sufficient uh, to hold or store all of our data. So it's better, you know, store that data in multiple machines or a cluster of machines. So Google file system was the research paper. If people are interested, they can read about it. But yeah, GFS is the concept or the research paper. Google file system is what we talk about. Google file system. So Google was the first company to publish a research paper in 2003, uh, talking about a concept where if the data which is being stored in a single machine cannot be stored in a single machine as the data keeps on growing, right? So they have researched this paper. 2004 was the time basically when kind of Hadoop framework came into the market. So Apache was the first company who developed Hadoop, but I think around 2004, Yahoo, Yahoo uh, implemented the GFS research paper, which was published by Google. So Yahoo email, if you remember, was the only, I think, email domain where people used to, you know, receive or send emails initially. So Yahoo utilized a GFS framework or the research paper, and they have implemented it, and they built up a concept called as HDFS. HDFS. And HDFS 1.0 came into the picture. So I will discuss about what is HDFS, how it came into picture, and... Uh, what was you know the things it was developed so google came into the picture in 2003 then yahoo then i think around 2006 apache which is an open source company it collaborated with hadoop to come up with the concept of apache hadoop so hadoop is a framework for big data technology within hadoop you have different things like hdfs 1.0 for storage, then we have MapReduce for you know processing as an engine, and then we have Yarn as a negotiator. So we'll talk about all these things in detail. So I just wanted to give you a roadmap like how things came into the market. So 1990s we were seeing a lot of 
terminologies around uh, big data but at 2003 the first research paper was published by google we called it as a google file system implementation of that people have uh, of that paper happened in 2004 so that implementation we call it as hdfs hadoop distributed file system it's a implementation of google file system yahoo was the company to implement this so uh, they were able to successfully implement, implement hdfs 2006 is the time when hadoop framework came into the market and hadoop consists of different things which we'll talk about you know uh, in much more depth so let me open my notepad and i'll explain all these things once again so 2003 gfs came into picture it's a research paper published by google it talks about storing data in cluster of machines if the data cannot be stored in a single machine so 2003 this gfs paper came into picture 2004 implementation of GFS took place by Yahoo. Yahoo was then email uh, top market leader. Basically, most of the emails which were you know sent or else received were through Yahoo. So they implemented GFS. They came up with the concept or framework, I can say, with the concept called mm-hmm. as. HDFS. If someone asks what is HDFS, it stands for Hadoop Distributed File System, right? 2006, Apache company. They came up with an open source technology called as. Apache Hadoop, and they collaborated with uh, HDFS. Basically, they collaborated with Yahoo. To use HDFS, if I talk about Hadoop 1.0, it consists of HDFS plus MapReduce. Plus Yarn. HDFS 1.0. Initially, there was only uh, HDFS and sorry Hadoop 1.0. Initially, there was only HDFS and MapReduce. Later, uh, Hadoop 2.0 came into picture. There we had HDFS plus MapReduce plus Yarn. basically some of the power of map reduce was given to yarn but yeah we'll talk about it in detail so this was the way hadoop came into the market basically whenever there was a need a new solution comes into practice so in order to process the big data a framework called hadoop came into the picture and this framework was developed by apache apache is a company and they collaborated with yahoo for their hdfs tool the technology so hadoop framework internally has hdfs mechanism right so we talked about evolution of hadoop uh, how it evolved and what is hadoop so hadoop is basically a big data framework we'll talk about what is hadoop it is a big data framework it is used to store and process big data to provide feasible solution right so that is the meaning of hadoop it's a framework basically this framework internally internally has three components right depending upon if it is hadoop 1.0 or hadoop 2.0 so if it is 2.0 we will have hdfs map reduce and yarn right it's a framework basically which is used to process the data and store the big data so that you can solve any big data problems and come up with a solution right 
Now we'll talk about the different components in Hadoop framework in detail, difference between Hadoop 1.0 and Hadoop 2.0. So for that, let me open my paint again. Okay, let me know if you're able to see my screen. Hadoop 1.0, Hadoop 2.0. So we have HDFS. Distributed file system. So it's called as a distributed file system because it is, you know, an implementation of Yahoo on their file distributed file system, which is DFS. So Yahoo implemented GFS and came up with HDFS. HDFS was combined with uh, Apache Spark to come up with Hadoop 1.0. So this is called as Hadoop distribution file system, right? So Hadoop one point has Hadoop, Hadoop distributed file system and MapReduce. We'll talk about it again. So I'm just explaining the major components. Here we have same HDFS, HDFS. Then we have MapReduce. And then we have YARN. Okay. What is HDFS? So for example, we have a huge file. Let's say it is around 3 GB file, right? So it is difficult. Let's say it is a 100 GB file or let's say it's a big file and I can't store and process it in a single machine. So my Hadoop framework say, okay, you need not store this entire file on a single machine. You can basically split it or divide it into blocks right split it or divide the file into blocks and store them in different machine so my block size block size is basically 64 mb in hadoop 1.0 And here my block size 128 MB. So in Hadoop 2.0, my block size is 128 MB. In Hadoop 1.0, my block size is 64 MB. So what is block size? It is basically the capacity of each block to store the files. Okay. So if someone asks me how many blocks are there in this particular, you know, machine or how many blocks are there sitting on this machine the formula is number of blocks equal to file size by 64 MB which is the size of each block right so number of file number of blocks is equal to the size of the file basically the how much size it is divided by size of each block which is 64 MB this is nothing but size of each block in bracket 64 MB right similarly the formula will be same over here number of blocks equal to file size by size of each block size of each block is 128 MB, right? This way, whenever a file is given to me, uh, depending upon the size of the file, first it calculates the number of blocks. And depending upon the number of blocks, we have to come up with the number of nodes based upon which the blocks will be fed into the number of nodes, right? So this is called HDFS. It's a distributed file system. What is MapReduce? MapReduce is a kind of engine, you know, which is used to process my files. HDFS will only store my files in a distributed fashion, but MapReduce is an engine which will run uh, in behind scenes, which will run some map and reduce jobs. So these jobs are kind of uh, jobs which work on key value pairs. So on just overview, I just want to talk about like my HDFS will help to split the data into different blocks. Each block of file will be sitting in some machine which you call as node. 
right? My MapReduce now will be processing the split data files, which are sitting in different nodes. And when all the files are processed, finally it will be submitted for aggregation, right? Which we call it call it as a reduce. So MapReduce is nothing but an engine which is used to process my files. Hadoop distributed file system is only to provide me the storage. Now someone will ask me what is the difference between Hadoop 1.0 and Hadoop 2.0. So the difference is initially MapReduce used to assign the task to different worker nodes or different nodes. Basically, it will take care, okay, which worker node is free, which is overloaded. Let me try to reduce the work from an overloaded machine to a less overloaded machine, right? All this task was initially assigned to MapReduce, but slowly the scientists understood like MapReduce responsibility is very high. Let me try to reduce it because obviously performance is going down. So they gave some of the responsibilities of MapReduce to another term, which we call it as YARN, right? Let me explain what is YARN. YARN stands for yet another resource negotiator by ARN. Okay. So yet another resource negotiator. What does this mean? Let's say today you have three machines. The data increased. Uh, initially, there were three machines which are storing different blocks of data. The architecture or the basically we'll discuss about the Hadoop architecture, how it is happening. Who will decide how many worker nodes are required or how the files are split into, into different nodes or who will decide whether I need some additional worker nodes. This all decision is take place by another component of Hadoop, which is called as yet another resource negotiator or YARN. Coming days in current technologies, we are seeing YARN, Mesos, Kubernetes as a kind of, you know, manager or a negotiator to provide us the resources. So that is a major difference between Hadoop 1.0 and Hadoop 2.0. So if someone asked me in the interview, what is Hadoop? So Hadoop is a big data framework, which is used to store and process my big data. To store the data, we have HDFS. To process the data, we have MapReduce. And uh, the difference between Hadoop 1.0 is versus Hadoop 2.0 is basically Hadoop 1.0 only has HDFS and MapReduce. Some additional responsibilities of MapReduce was given to another component in Hadoop 2.0, which we call it as YARN. YARN means yet another resource negotiator. It is helping us to, you know, tell basically when additional resources required or not, depending upon the size of the files. This is called as difference between Hadoop 1.0 and Hadoop 2.0. Now let me go back to the notepad. So we talked about what is Hadoop. It's a big data framework. We spoke about the different components in Hadoop, which is HDFS, MapReduce, and YARN. And also I spoke about the difference between Hadoop 1.0 and Hadoop 2.0. So now let me go to the third component, which is very, very important concept in big data engineering. Let me draw it once again. So the concept itself is called as a master slave architecture, master slave architecture. I hope my screen is visible. If not, let me zoom it a bit. Let me increase the font size. Okay, master slave architecture. Many a times people will ask, okay, how the data is split between the different nodes. So we have a master node and we have worker node or slave nodes, right? So I'll talk about the architecture first, right? So this is my master, capital M, master node, right? And these are my worker nodes. So Worker is basically slave, right? In previous uh, terminology. So these are my slaves or worker nodes. Worker nodes. So master node can also be called as name node. I can write here master node or name node or parent node. One and the same, right? Here it is slave node or worker node 
we also called it as data nodes or child nodes let me expand this right so this is a master node and these are my child nodes let me take this as one two three four and five right so let's say i have a file with a huge file let's say we are in hadoop 2.0 which is the latest one we are in hadoop 2.0 so if i talk about hadoop 2.0 we will have hdfs for storage map reduce for processing and yarn for you know resource negotiator now let's say i have a file i will calculate the number of blocks right number of blocks is nothing but the total file size by 128 mb right depending upon that i'll get the number of blocks so now each blocks will be stored into five different data nodes how they are going to save or how they are going to store is so the formula is basically number of blocks is equal to it is not number of uh, blocks i can say it number of nodes only directly number of nodes is equal to file size by 128 mb which is the standard size of each blocks so the total file size by the total num by the standard size of each block will give me the number of nodes so let's say for example we got number of nodes as 5 right now the blocks of each file will be stored here in five different machine so my master node is the parent node or you can call it as a name node it will see which worker is working on which block of file how the worker is working if the worker performance down master node will be notified based upon the notification we receive on master node my yarn will study okay something is wrong let me give some another resource where the child node or the slave node is not performing well or if the performance of all the five nodes is down because the file size is increasing incrementally then i can assign some other nodes which is given by yarn right but yeah this is the way a master node will see which worker node is working on which block of file let's say i have some 10 blocks of file let me draw a table let's say we have block 1 block 2 block 3 and block 4 these are four different blocks of files which are stored in these nodes let's say block 1 is stored in number 2 comma 3 now people will ask me why it is stored in two different nodes let's say now node number 2 is down but i have still my block 1 stored in node number 3 which can be recovered from node number 3 right if in case my block 2 is down so similarly let's say block 2 is stored in 1 comma 4 block 3 is stored in 2 comma 5 right each node will be required each node will be storing some two blocks of file right i'm just giving an example so why what is this why we are storing each block of file in different nodes this concept is called as replication factor rf so replication factor by default is equal to 3 basically each block of file you will see three different copies of the same block of file which will be stored in different machines right whenever one of my machine is down or when of one of the worker node is down i can retrieve that file from some other worker nodes that is why replication factor is very much important in the industry these days so we have understood master and we have seen how master nodes and worker nodes are arranged how different blocks of files are stored in different worker nodes now let me also explain you the heartbeat mechanism you know our heart is basically beating so heart beat how many seconds it is 70 seconds right uh, 75 75 beats in a minute in a human being similarly my worker node has some kind of heart you can just assume like the worker nodes send signals to master by some electrical impulse okay this signals we call it as a heartbeat in you know science we call it as heartbeat here the frequency is every 3 seconds
every three seconds, my worker node will send some kind of signal to master. Basically, it will tell, okay, my worker node is alive. It is three seconds or 30 seconds, every 30 seconds, sorry. Every 30 seconds, my worker node will be sending some signals to master. Let's say after a certain time, my worker node has stopped, has stopped working because of some malfunction. So generally the worker nodes are made up of cheap commodity hardware. Why we use it, we are not sure, but many a times we see that worker nodes stop working. Obviously the reason is it is made up of cheap commodity hardware. Master nodes, very rarely they stop working, but yeah. So secondary backup if a worker nodes is not working, the files which are stored here, I'll try to grab it from different other nodes till the time worker node one is replaced. Okay. So for every 30 seconds, my worker node will send a signal to master. Let's say something happened with worker node number one for 30 seconds. It did not see a signal. Next 30 seconds. It did not send a signal. Master node will get alarm. It will see, okay, my worker node is down. I want to see which blocks are blocks of file is being, uh, is affected. So I can see block number two is sitting on worker number worker node number one and block number four is also sitting on worker node number one. So basically B2 and B4, I will see, okay, B2 is also sitting on four. So I can fetch B2 from four, right? And I can fetch uh, B4 from five, right? Till the time a worker node one is revived or till the time we have some alternate for worker node number one. So master data, basically, master nodes or not data master node will have kind of uh, metadata this metadata which will tell which block of file is sitting on which machine many a times when a client computer so let me assume this as a client computer okay i can write it as client whenever client requests okay i want to process a file please give me the final result from block number two I'm just giving you a random example. So my client will talk with master. Okay. I want to see the output of block number two master node will have a master metadata. This is a metadata. It will see block number two, wherever it is sitting. So B2 is sitting on one and four, one and four. Let's say one is down. So I can get the data of one from four and five. Okay. And B2 is also sitting on four. So I can rely on these two worker nodes. So master data has this metadata which it will read through to see, okay, which nodes uh, are the worker nodes. Basically, my blocks are sitting on which nodes and master node will ask, okay, hey, worker number four and five, I want to process block number two. Please process it and give it to me because the client is requesting. So this kind of architecture is called as a master slave architecture or parent child architecture or name node or data nodes architecture. So this mechanism, wherever the worker nodes is sending a signal to master node, we call it as a heartbeat mechanism, right? This mechanism happens for every 30 seconds till two cycles. Master node will see, okay, if the worker node is not sending any signals, it means it is dead. I need to revive it or I need to, uh, you know, get another alternative for this worker node till that time I have replica of data, which can be used from different other data nodes, right? Now someone will ask me, hey Aditya, what if master node is gone? How will I fetch another master node? So the scenes are very rare. Let's say there's a power failure or there's a server down. If a master node is you know, not uh, giving us the prompt signals, what we try to do is we try to revive it first, right? If the master node is still not revived after doing uh, you know, update or patch, if the master node is still not working, I'll come up with a concept of a secondary name node. This is called as a secondary name node. This is primary name node. This is secondary name node. S N N S N Latin caps S N N, which is basically secondary name node. What it means exactly. If my master node is down for a certain reason, and if I'm not able to revive my master node, I have to go towards a secondary name node, right? So how my secondary name node understands my master node is down. There is a kind of a feature called as a lock mechanism. There's a lock in between master node and secondary name node. 
So whenever a metadata is stored in master node, the same copy of the metadata will be stored or maintained in secondary name node. So what happens is basically, whenever my master node is down, secondary name node also receives some kind of signals from master node. Whenever my master name node is down, or my name node is down, or my master node is down, there will be a lock which will be opened, by which basically there's a lock. If the lock is open, basically, secondary name node will take place of master name node and secondary name node will now uh, you know communicate with all the different worker nodes or data nodes i can say so first thing first we'll try to revive the one which is lost basically we'll try to do a patch up or we'll try to restart the system if my master node is able to work if not we'll try to go towards secondary name node we'll try to open the lock uh, secondary no name node is nothing but a backup node for us so that lock once open, my secondary name node will become my master node. And then again, it will function as a master node only. So whenever this secondary name node becomes master node, there will be another node, which will take place of the secondary name node. Basically, we need to give another hardware or another server or system which will act as a secondary name node, a backup for the previous secondary name node, which is now acting as a primary node. So I hope you have understood the architecture of master slave. Master is a parent. Slave is basically worker nodes or child or data nodes. The parent will only have metadata, which will tell which block of file is stored in which node, right? My data is actually stored in the worker nodes or data nodes or slave nodes. My metadata is stored in master node. So master will communicate with different nodes to fetch the data depending upon the client request. So whenever a data node is not sending signal for more than two cycles then master data will see okay there's something wrong with the data node let me try to replace it so till the time it is being replaced we are fetching the data from different other nodes where the block of files are being saved that concept we call it as a replication factor right and if suppose my master node is down i'll try to revive it by sending some signals or you know by doing a force restart or by sending some patch up if my master node cannot be revived, I also have a secondary name node, which is a backup node, which still has a copy of metadata. This copy of metadata is being updated time to time, and it is also maintained in secondary name node. So if my master name node is not working or my master node is not working, I'll try to use my secondary name node for the timing purpose. So secondary name node becomes my master node here, and then we'll arrange another hardware, which will act as a secondary name node. This is the concept of uh, master slave architecture. I have. I hope you have understood it. If you still have any concepts, questions, please ask me freely. So there is another concept which I think many people talk about relating to replication factor, which we talk about as fault tolerance. So what do you mean by fault tolerance? What does it mean? So basically, every file which is being stored in a big data environment, you need to have a backup of those files. Let's say today you are storing some data in Chennai server. You also store the data in Delhi server and Mumbai server. Why? Because let's say in Chennai, some floods happens, right? Many a times we are seeing some floods or a uh, cyclone happening in Chennai. Let's say some, something happened in Chennai. Uh, then I won't be able to, you know, uh, fetch the data from Chennai because there is no power, power or there is no internet connectivity. So in that case, I have to rely upon some other data center uh, as a backup for the same data. So if Chennai is not working, I'll go towards Delhi and I'll fetch the data. Obviously, time will be more because of the distance, but yeah, I am still able to get the data. So fault tolerance is basically a concept to fetch the data by having a backup mechanism, right? My system becomes fault tolerant when we have more number of backup mechanism. It is very huge, crucial, very, very crucial because if my data is lost, it will be a huge impact to the company, right? So I need to have backup mechanisms in place so that if server A is down, I can directly go towards server B or server C or server D. This concept is called as fault tolerant. Whatever system you design, make sure the systems are fault tolerant. This concept is very much asked in the interview. Please try to understand it, right? Let me go back to my notepad. So I have explained to you uh, the master slave architecture and how the heartbeat mechanisms work, right? Now I'll talk about the different other components in Hadoop 2.0. Let me go back to the Hadoop screen. 
right? So in Hadoop, we also have other different components such as, let me write over here, we have Hive, we have uh, Spark, we have Scoop, we have Pig. So we have a lot of other components also. So let's discuss overview of each one of them. I don't want to go in depth because these are not used anymore by the cloud technologies. But uh, some basic uh, information is still required. Yeah, except Spark, most of the things are not being used so much in the market. But yeah, Spark is very much used. I'll talk about Spark in depth. Uh, but yeah, we'll go one by one. So what is Hive? Hive is nothing but an open source data warehouse which is built for Hadoop environment. You know, MapReduce jobs in the backend, everything is working on Java, right? The processing part for MapReduce happens in Java. Now the scientists came and the engineers were sitting together. They were thinking, okay, why do I need to write so many complex lines of code to run the big data jobs? Why cannot I write some SQL queries? So they understood, okay, you can still write SQL queries instead of writing those complex Java code. You can do it by, you know, writing SQL queries, wrapper class. So Hive is nothing but a C a wrapper class on top of MapReduce. Basically, you will write all the SQL queries on Hive in the backend. These SQL queries will be converted to Java and will be fed into the MapReduce machine, right? So it becomes very much easy for me as a developer when I'm writing the SQL query. I need not write the thousand lines of code. I can still code hundred lines of code in SQL. Convert in the backend, these SQL queries are converted to Java complex language, which is fed to MapReduce machine, right? So Hive is a data warehouse or a wrapper class on top of MapReduce. We write SQL queries. So the SQL queries which we write is called as HQL. HQL means Hive query language. It is similar to SQL, just they name it as HQL. Some syntax difference, but yeah, you'll be writing SQL queries in the backend. These queries will be converted to Java language, right? Now, what is Spark? People have realized, okay, if we use this kind of components, HDFS, MapReduce, Yarn, Map reduce jobs are very, very slow. It takes a lot of time, right? Instead of map reduce, industry went towards Spark. Spark was again developed by Apache framework, Apache company. They, that's why they call it as Apache Spark, right? So if someone asks me what is Spark, let me open my notepad again. Spark. It is general purpose in memory compute. The difference between MapReduce is, if someone asks the difference between MapReduce and Spark, so in MapReduce, you are reading from disk and writing back to the disk for each and every compute. Basically, for each line of code, I'm reading the data. For each line of code, I'm reading the data from the disk, processing it, and writing it back to the final disk. This is MapReduce, and that is why MapReduce jobs are very slow in the nature. But why Spark is so much important? Why do you read, or why do you see Spark everywhere? Because everything is happening in memory. All the storage, all the processing, happens happens in memory reducing the seek time or basically input output time right that's why spark is fast that's why today's hadoop 2.0 we will have hdfs apache spark and we will have yarn as a negotiator. It can be yarn or mesos or Kubernetes, depending upon the company. These are all resource management tools. It will tell you, okay, how many resources are required. Dynamically, it will increase your cluster size, depending upon the size of file is required to be processed, right? Let me go back to the point. Spark is general in-purpose compute engine. Instead of map reduce low job, I will use Spark because all my storage and computation will happen in memory. Hive is a data warehouse where I'll be writing SQL queries 
all the queries whatever i write is converted to java code in the backend and it saves lot of complexity from developer because we are writing all the code in sql and which is converted to java in the backend scoop is a technology which is used to transform the data from on prem to from one layer to other layer so you can assume scoop as an ice cream scoop the person who gives us the ice cream an ice cream vendor he takes out the scoop and put it put it put it in on uh, putting it on a scoop of uh, cone right so similarly in big data scoop is a, t- a terminology or technology which is used to transfer data from one layer or one system to other system right it is not used nowadays we have different etl tools in the market this is again a huge time consuming jobs and now we are not no longer using it then we have uzi uzi is basically to schedule or orchestrate some kind of jobs again uzi is not used nowadays i haven't seen much of the job openings around uzi pig pig is similar to map reduce these are you know some kind of compute which will reduce uh, the stress on the engine but yeah pigs also these days are not used so these are different uh, components majorly these days we use hive and spark only out of all the things hdfs obviously is being used all the data which is stored in my big data environment are hdfs files hive is still used spark is majorly used no one can replace spark till date because it has already removed lot of dependency by removing map reduce right I hope I have answered this question. Let me go back to the next topic, which is, I think we have covered, explained the different components in Hadoop 2.0. So we have HDFS, Spark. Instead of MapReduce, we have Spark, and then we have Yarn. Point number five, and I think the many points we can cover in Module three. Right? Let me talk about the difference between ETL and ELT. What is ETL? ETL stands for Extraction, Transformation. and loading whereas elt stands for same extraction then loading and transformation i'll explain you all these things with a diagram because it will be easy for you to understand right let me take a new diagram you have data sitting in a source this is my source source is nothing but the initial layer from which you need to grab the data right and i need to put the data in this target environment this is my target right to bring the data from source to target i will follow an etl process the process is called etl so the process is etl but the pipeline pipeline if you ask me what is pipeline pipeline is a component which is used to fetch the data from source to target it's a component which connects at source and it pulls the data from source and syncs or ingests that data into target when it extracts the data extraction happens at source it is extracting the data from source okay and it will transform it somewhere in the middle transformation will be happening over here somewhere in the middle and then it will load the data in the target so extraction transformation loading so where this transformation is happening these are happening somewhere in the stage tables right so this process which connects a source to target which will extract the data from the source and which will load the data into target it's called as an etl extraction transformation loading i hope everything is clear If you have enjoyed watching this video please do like and subscribe to Scalers YouTube channel If you want to watch similar content in future do not forget to subscribe to Scalers YouTube channel Thank you for watching this video we'll see you again